All right, so welcome to the second lecture in this mini course. Um, yesterday I was explaining about the existential theory of the reals from a computational complexity perspective. And um, today I'll make applications to decision problems about games in various forms. Um, so let me remind you, uh, or let me tell you what we'll, we'll be doing. Um, we were defining the so-called complexity class Ex corresponding to the existential theory of the reals. And I use this notation here, um, exist reals. So that's, um, that has many different definitions. Um, and one way would be by means of the blum tube smell model of computation. You could say it's the Boolean part of polynomial time over the reals, where you don't allow any constants. Um, Another way would be to simply say what is a complete problem of the class and then take the closure on the polynomial time many one reductions. So one such complete problem is the language squad. Um, so here we are given just a, a list of quadratic equations and we look to determine if the set of um, equations um, or polynomials have a common root, right? So, so we're given degree two polynomials um, let's say P1 to PS um, and the question is simply and here, yeah, let me also specify where they are so they are um, maybe they have rational coefficients or you could just assume they have integer coefficients. Let's now say in n variables. So we ask is there um, x in n dimensional space such that all these polynomials evaluate to zero at the given point. So that was a, that is what we saw in the lecture yesterday. This is complete for, for this class. Um, and now this will be the, the base of showing complexity results about questions about games. Um, however, where it really started or what enabled the, the first result about games was the realization that um, we could impose a promise on this problem, um, namely that if the system has a solution, it has a solution in the unit ball. So that is, um, that was proven by, by Schaefer. So I'll write it that quad is um, still hard for the existence here of the reals um, with promise if solution x exists then a solution another solution x exists in the unit ball And um, so this seems to be only true in the, in the setting, in the discrete setting of this class here. So not, probably not true in the blum schupf smale model of computation. So here we are actually using that the input is discrete and we're gonna apply this um, result from real algebraic um, geometry. For our purposes, it's, um, yeah, let me write who this was due to. Schaefer, um, for our purposes, it will be more convenient um, or more useful not to go to the unit ball, but to go to the unit corner simplex. Um, so let me, let me change the statement to that. So 
So I'll use this notation here. So um, and also define it. This is just a set of n-dimensional vectors where all the coordinates are non-negative. Um, and um, they sum to at most one. All right. So we'll prove this, um, this statement. So, um, so let's give the proof here. So what we'll do is to take a, a given system of this form, given by a quad, and we'll um, then say, let's say the bit length of the coefficients is tall, and we know the degree is at most two, and then we'll apply this, um, this result. So let P1 up to Ps be these polynomials. And let's assume that the coefficient bit size is tall. Um, so then if the system has a solution, so that's a sign condition saying that all the polynomials are zero. If that even is realizable, so if there's a solution, this result guarantees it'll be in a ball centered around the origin of this radius here. Um, so we can find an, an R of this form. So it's two to the toe, two to the um, order n. So be such that a solution, if exists, is guaranteed in this ball. Um, so now the idea is that we'll um, construct by introducing auxiliary variables and auxiliary equations, we'll construct an extremely tiny number, so a doubly exponentially or inversely, inverse doubly exponentially small number, and we use this number to scale down the, the solution of, of this ball down into, um, you could go to the unit ball or unit ball, or we'll go into this um, corner simplex. Um, so let's define how many times we need to do repeated squaring. And um, so we need to get to, um, to doubly exponential, so we can take twice log of this number r and um, and get above this, and um, actually, let me let me change n here to k just for for my own benefit, for my own sake. All right. So let t be then um, order of twice log of this much. Um, so order log tau plus, um, plus k, such that 2 to the 2 to the t. And I want this to be um, greater than r. I actually want it to be a little bit bigger. So I want to make it um, at least 32 times k times r. Um, now I'll define new variables. Um, So I'll take my 
um, my initial k um, Yeah, let me say how many polynomials I have. So I have S polynomials to begin with, then I'll have T plus one polynomials in um, and in this case I'll do two times K plus T plus one variables. And my variables are are gonna be given by X and then auxiliary variables. And I'll actually use um, one, the different ways of proving this. One we would be to translate. Um, what I'll instead do is to um, write variables as a difference between two non-negative variables. So I'll double the amount of variables we have. So to 2k, and then I'll have an additional t plus one many variables. So I'll name the variables um, x1 plus, x1 minus, to um, xk plus xk minus, and then I'll have y0 up to yt. And um, now let's define the, um, the equations. So what I'll make sure is that um, y0 is going to be the really small number, so I'm going to define yt to be a half, and then as I step down in indices, I'll do repeated squaring. Um, so we'll make the following um, set of equations. So we want to do that yt minus a half is equal to zero. And then we want to do um, when I want to do yj um, minus yj plus one squared is equal to zero, and this is for j equals to from zero up to t minus one. So what this implies is that um, so in any solution to these equations, of course, yt is going to be a half. And it means that y0 is going to be 2 to the minus 2 to the t. So let me note that. This is going to be the doubly exponentially small number I'll use to, to scale down the solution. So I'm going to write the original variables. These are xi's. I would write these as a difference between um, um, the difference between the positive part and the negative part. Um, but I want, to, I want these to be in the corner simplex. So these are really small numbers and I want to allow this to be really big. And this is why I divide by the really tiny number y0. So I take these and substitute into my original polynomials to define new polynomials. Um, so my new polynomials are going to be um, qj is going to be where I take pj, sorry, <clears throat> pj, I take y1 plus minus, sorry, x1 plus minus x1 minus divided by um, y0 all the way up to yk plus minus yk minus divided by y0. And these were degree two polynomials. So as I do this substitution, um, you can see in the terms I get, if I expand everything out, I'll divide by um, either one or y zero or y zero squared. So to recover a polynomial, I'm gonna multiply this expression by y zero squared. 
So these are now my, my new polynomials. Um, so all the blue polynomials, and this is for j from one up to um, s, right? So I have these polynomials representing the original polynomials where I scale down the solution space, and I have these um, other polynomials doing the repeated squaring, making the, you could say, a virtual infinitesimal. Um, all right, so it's quite see, easy to see that if, if the original um, system now has a solution, the, the new system is going to have a solution and vice versa. Um, what, what matters is that we want to make sure that we satisfy the promise so we want to be in the unit corner simplex. And, um, and let's do that. Uh, so suppose we have this solution here. Um, Um, then from this solution, we get a solution of the new system. We need to define um, y2 to be a half. And then as we just step down in indices, we need to square. And in the end, we'll get that y0 is 2 to the minus 2 to the t. And um, how to assign values to these things here? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add... Um, R to the number, and then take um, take the max of um, R and 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 that number. Let me let me write it down. So I want to say that X I plus um, is defined to be Y zero times um, max of R and R plus Xi. Xi minus is going to be Y0 times max of R and R minus Xi. So now you see if you take the difference between Xi plus and Xi minus, um, then what happens? Then you exactly um, and, and then you divide by y0, you exactly recover um, x i. Right? Um, so now we need to determine um, how large are the variables and etc. So what we can see to begin with is that all the variables are strictly positive. So all the, the yj's are strictly positive by, by definition in any solution. And these are also going to be strictly positive since I first translate by uh, or add R and, and then take the max. We can, um, right, so I'll erase some stuff here. So we want to sum up all the variables and see what their sum is. So we can start out by summing the yj's. Um, and what's that equal to? Well, you can say the first one starts out to be a, being a half, and then, um, then a quarter, and then we get to um, one sixteenth, and, and now I don't want to do it anymore, but just do a rough estimation. I want to say that it's less than the sum of all powers of 
um, of a half. from j from zero to infinity. Um, so I get a strict inequality here. So this is, um, this will be sufficient. Um, so the sum of this thing here is, is, um, is two, and then we get one eighth. So it means that we have one eighth, we have two eighths, and we have um, four eighths for a total of seven eighths. All right, so for the values of the yj's, we already spent seven eighths. So now I wanna estimate the xi plus and the xi minus. And we can estimate um, both of them. So we already saw they're, they're positive. And um, we can see that xi is in particular less than or equal to r and also minus x is also less than or equal to r. So both of these expressions inside the max is at most two times r and then I multiply with, with y0. Um, so, and y0 has the value of two to the minus two to the t times two times r. And then I have to remember um, how, I, how I define this. Um, so, so what did I say? I said um, one over 32 times k times r. Uh, So it means that they're at most 1 16th times, times k. Um, and I have, two of the, I have two times k of these in total, and um, it means I sum them all up. I'm guaranteed, I, so I'm gonna have a strict inequality somewhere. So where, where do I have it? I have it here. Uh, no, I, I actually don't need the strict inequality. I would, I would um, actually like to have um, the strict inequality. Um, well, you, you can make sure you have the strict inequality. It's sum up to less than one eighth. Oh wait, no, I don't need it. I have the strict inequality here. That's what you said. Yeah. So this is so the the sum of all these guys x i plus and x i minus from one to k is bounded by one eighth. So the total sum of all the variables is strictly less than one. So I'm guaranteed that if I have a solution, then I'm having a new solution to my new system that's actually strictly inside the unit corner simplex. Um, I also have the property that all the individual variables, they're actually um, they're actually at most a half. So the biggest one is, is yt. Um, and um, maybe these are just some additional properties that's nice to have. I'll not use them today, but, um, but we'll use it in, in the paper I'll, I'll describe. All right, any questions about this? All right, so, so I have this, I, I have the original system. I'm saying that this has a solution if and only if the new system has a solution. Yeah, and furthermore, if there is a solution, then there's gonna be a, a solution in the unit corner simplex of this new system. So it satisfies this promise I claimed. So I started out with a system that did not satisfy the promise, and now it, it satisfies the promise. Oh, this 
yeah, it was a reduction. Right. Um, so that was just um, a similar thing. And um, that's all we need for real algebraic geometry for, for now. So we'll start moving towards something that is applicable to, to games. So to work with games, it's convenient to, to work with probability distribution. So we, need, we, we would like to have statements talking about probability distributions. Now we're already in the corner simplex and we can simply add a slack variable to get to the actual unit simplex. Um, so let me, let me do that. Um, so we were given this system that we just constructed. Um, now let me use Let me use new notation here. So imagine this is a system we just constructed. These are quadratic equations. Or degree two polynomials. Um, and we have that it is um, hard for the existential theory of the reals to, to decide if there is a solution. And we are promised that a solution may be found in the unit corner simplex. So now let's move to, um, to probability distributions. So we'll define the actual unit simplex So that's now in, in R plus one dimensional space. Sorry, N plus one dimensional space. And now we just wanna say that they are um, non-negative all coordinates and that the sum of all coordinates is exactly equal to one. All right, so we'll go from such a system here to a system where we search for a solution in the unit simplex and we'll simply introduce a slack variable. Um, and um, so that's done. Now we are now we are already in the in the unit simplex. What is furthermore nice is that when we are here, we can move to homogeneous systems of equations. <coughs> so we have an equation saying exactly that The sum of all the coordinates, now including the slack variable, is, is equal to one. So we can multiply this onto all degree, degree one terms of every polynomial, and we can multiply this squared onto all, to, to the constant term if, if it exists in the polynomial. So what we obtain by doing this is that we get a homogeneous system of degree two polynomials in such a way that, um, it is hard for the existential theory, or let's say even complete for the existential theory of the reals to determine if there is a solution inside the unit simplex. All right, so this we'll use for, for the second construction today. Um, I'll make another modification to this system. So this is quite, um, quite typical of this area that you need to transform the, the system or the problem into whatever is applicable or you can use for your reduction. Um, 
so this, this we got homogeneous degree two polynomials. We can actually move even to bilinear systems of polynomials. Um, so we could call this bilinear, uh, yeah. So this is the problem where we have bilinear polynomials. Um, and even homogeneous polynomials. The question is, is there a pair of points inside um, the unit simplex such that Um, Q of QK of X comma Y is equal to zero for all K. So I claim this is also complete for the existence of theory of the reals. And we can do a similar, similar transformation where we start with this system over here. Um, and before doing anything, we, um, we introduce variables y1 up to yn. Um, so that's that's first step. Um, second step, we actually want to make sure that that these are the same, so we want that xi is equal to yi, and we'll do that by introducing new equations. Um, All right, and then we do as we did over here, we introduce slack variables and then we homogenize. Right, so this is, um, if we do these steps, then we get the result that this problem bilinear homogeneous quad is complete for the existential theory of the reals. All right, so these are the two problems we'll use to establish hardness or completeness results about games. So one is just this problem here where we look at homogeneous polynomials, homogeneous degree two polynomials and this here is where we look at bilinear homogeneous um, degree two polynomials. All right, so the first application to, to game theory is gonna be to normal form games. Um, so I will briefly introduce um, normal form games, maybe just to establish notation. Um, so I don't know how many of you actually know all the definitions about uh, normal form games and nice equilibrium. <laughs> you know it, good, <laughs> excellent. Um, so so I'll do it, um, and maybe maybe I'll just do a small example first. So we'll be concerned with three player games in particular. Um, and um, how to write up a, a three-player game. So two-player games, you normally write it as a matrix. A three-player game, I'll write it as, as a tensor. Here, I'll just look at a two by two by two game. So we have three players, and each player have, um, has two strategies. 
So I'll call this game um, H1. And I'm going to write it in the form of um, two matrices. I think that's not enough space, actually. I should probably write it on top of each other. Then. So I have two matrices, and um, these will correspond to actions of player one. So player one gets to choose which matrix it is, um, and we'll call the actions G, and we'll call it, um, yeah, where to actually write this, I think over here, G and, and bottom. So we'll make sense to that a little later. So player one gets to choose which matrix we play. Then player two gets to choose a, a row, and player three gets to choose a column. And we'll also call these um, actions for G and bottom. Um, so that's an example of a game, and um, I'll use that to introduce some notation. Um, before, let me say this, um, this work here is, or these results I'll start by presenting, is um, joint work with um, Marie-Louisa Bertelsen. And it was published at SACT uh, last year. All right, so what is a, a normal form game G? So we're gonna have a bunch of players and let's say we have M players. Each player has a set of pure strategies S1 up to Sm and these will just be finite sets and um, then we're gonna have utility functions and the utility functions takes um, a tuple, so a selection of an action from each set of pure strategies, one for each player, and produces a real number called the utility. So now I can explain how to read this, this table here. Um, so this here is a game where we have three players, each player has two pure strategies, and I've written in, tab in tabular form the utility functions inside this. So um, this box here corresponds to player one selecting G, player two selecting G, and player three selecting G. And these three numbers are going to be the utilities to each of the three players. Um, what are solution concepts? So I'll work with Nash equilibrium in mixed strategies. Um, so we'll have that um, YSI, that's a set of probability distributions. over S i, and um, if we have x, it's now a tuple of 
probability distributions over actions. Um, let's now call a strategy profile and we can extend the utility function of every player to the set of strategy profiles. So the utility function of player i on strategy profile x, well, what is that? So it's the expectation where we select each action for each player j according to the probability distribution for the, the player j. And then we take the utility function of player i and um, evaluate it on the selected actions. Right, so that's the utility to a given player on this strategy profile. Um, some useful notation is that we write x minus i semicolon y if y is chosen from is a probability distribution for player i. Then this here is where you take and replace x i by y and get a new strategy profile. And this will also be written as x um, replaced by y. We say that y is a best reply to x if if y is maximizing the utility, um, so y is a strategy for player i, so we say it's the best reply if it's maximizing the utility for player i, assuming the others play according to x. So this is if yi of x replaced by y is at least um, um, Right. And now the solution concept or the definition of an S equilibrium is that X is an S equilibrium if XI is the best reply to X for all players I. All right, so that's the definition of a Nash equilibrium. So we can attempt to find all Nash equilibria in this game here. Um, let me say one, one thing about this game. If you notice, this, has, this is a free player game, but it has one particular property. It's a so-called zero-sum game. Um, so if you sum the utilities of all the players, no matter what happens, the sum is gonna be equal to zero. Um, so the results that we are proving are, a lot of them are in fact about zero-sum three-player games improving on previous results concerning just three-player games. Um, so what would an S equilibrium, um, an S equilibrium be in this case? So you can, you can have a quick look and, and see what, what happens. Excuse me? Maximizing. Yeah, yeah, players want to maximize their, their, their utility, of course, but, uh, but we're just looking for, we're just looking for an asset cleaver, not, not talking about any, anything about their payoffs other than that. First matrix and um, so so remember here so maybe it's a bit unusual for you to think about this but player one is selecting amongst the matrices so so comparing the the action of player one you have to look at the you look at the first coordinate but you have to switch to the to the other matrix. Right, so you can see that you actually have an Nash equilibrium here. So that's a pure Nash equilibrium. No player has incentive to, to deviate in this case here. Um, so you can see if, if player one is doing something differently, well, 
player one is still receiving zero, player two is um, receiving zero, and, and player three is also receiving zero. Another pure Nash equilibrium is, um, is this one down here. So the all bottom strategy, so all players playing the bottom strategy. So why is this? So player one is prefers minus two to minus four. Um, player two receives one, which is the same as here, and player three receives one, which is the same as here. And you can easily see that there are no other there. Um, and um, player two picks a, a row, yes. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, no, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. It, it's, it's, a, it's much worse, yeah. I was... Um, the third player... Received minus three, yeah, 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 you're right. Um, yeah, so, so that's much worse, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Argument was much simpler. Um, and you can see that there are no others. Um, so maybe I'll leave it for, as an exercise for now. Now what we'll do now is to take this system of bilinear quadratic equations and transform into a three-player normal form game. It's going to be a three-player zero-sum normal form game. And I'm going to describe, uh, give the strategies for, for each player. Um, so, um, yeah, let me actually change this to L, um, just to not confuse myself. So we have L polynomials now. Um, this will be a game just defined on the polynomials in a, in a rather natural way. So the set of strategies of player one is gonna be that player one is selecting a polynomial, but also selecting a sign. So player one can choose to play the polynomial or play the negative of the polynomial. Player two and player three, so they're just selecting uh, or playing a variable. And um, so here we have n plus one variables. Um, so it's just a set from one up to n plus one. And now let's define the utilities. Um, the utility of player one. And um, so I'll select this. I'll call this the sign and this the index of the polynomial. So S comma K is the strategy of player one. Player two selects a variable XI, player three selects a variable YJ. Um, so this is simply gonna be equal to S times um, AIJK, where I'm gonna introduce some notation or explain what are the coefficients of each polynomial. So let's say that QK of x comma y is equal to the sum of aij superscript k xi yj. Um, and actually, to make to make it a little bit simpler, I'll I'll multiply by by two here. The utilities of player two and player three is going to be the same. Um, They're actually going to be negative of this, so they'll split the negative of the utility of player one. In this way, we get a zero sum game. So it's going to be minus s times aij superscript k. So now notice the 
the following lemma just obvious from the definition. Um, for any strategy profile of player two and player three, and I'll call that x comma y, we have that the utility to player one, if player one selects s comma k, player two selects the strategy x, and player three is the strategy y, then this is actually precisely equal to two times the sine s times the polynomial evaluated on the pair, polynomial qk evaluated on x comma y. All right. Um, So this just follows from the, everything we have defined so far. This is um, this here is exactly the utility to, or if you multiply this by two times s, this is the utility to player one um, when player two plays x i and player three plays y j. One thing we can now notice is that if we consider this game, um, um, then. Um, also notice that uh, if player one plays the uniform strategy, set then um, the utility, and then it's set comma x comma y is equal to zero. Because it means that also, so player one chooses a random polynomial and then also a random sign, so they'll all cancel out and get zero. And since it's a zero sum game and player two and player three just splits the negative of player one's payoff, then everyone gets zero in this case. Um, so we can observe that any Nash equilibrium payoff profile And by payoff profile, I mean that I take a Nash equilibrium and then I see what are the payoffs to each player is of the form two times u time comma minus u comma minus u for some u, which is at least zero. And now finally we can relate it to solutions of the system. Um, so I'm going to say that if x comma y is solution to system, to this bilinear system, and we let z be the uniform distribution for player one, Then we get a Nash equilibrium and all players receive payoff zero. So why is that? So, um, so if player two and player three plays x comma y, then all polynomials evaluate to zero and this means no matter what player one does, all, um, all, is, all are receiving payoff zero. So player one uh, has no incentive to change from the uniform distribution. And likewise, player one plays the uniform distribution guaranteeing that all get zero. So player two and player three have no incentive to change to a different strategy. More importantly, of course, is that we have the converse If we have a Nash equilibrium of, with payoff profile all zeros, then the strategies of player two and player three are gonna form a solution to the bilinear system.
And why is that? Well, suppose x comma y is not a solution to the system. Then one of the polynomials does not evaluate to zero. So it's something non-zero. It might be positive, it might be negative. And player one can choose to play that polynomial together with a sign being able to receive payoff strictly more than zero. All right, so now we have obtained a result about Nash equilibria. We have proven that it's hard for the existential theory of the reals to decide if there's a Nash equilibrium um, in which all players receive payoff at least zero, or if all players receive payoff at most zero. And this holds for three player zero sum games. Uh, no, no, so Papa Dimitri, uh, so, so here you mean Daskalagis and, and, and Goldberg and, yeah, so, but that is PPAD, that's about, that's about finding an astroclibrium or computing a astroclibrium. Mm -hmm. This here is, is a decision problem. Um, you want to decide, is there an astroclibrium with these properties? with the property that each player receive pay off zero. So, so it's much different than the search, this is decision, and probably much harder than, um, than finding an asphalt clip room. And we are in the three player case when actually it is the fixed P complexity class that captures search for equilibrium, not, not PPAD. Um, for two players it's NP, it's NP Harden, and that is um, by Gilboa and Semmel. Um, same question in, uh, in two player games. Same, no. So deciding is if in a bi-matrix game, um, there's an S equilibrium where players receive a guaranteed payoff of zero, but this obviously does not hold in zero in two-player zero-sum games because um, no. because there is a unique payoff profile. Anyways, um, so this here is like the initial thing. This is where we start and we improve and prove additional results about decision problems in in games. And I can indicate how how these are are proved. Rather simple case. We'll build a gadget like this here. Um, I'll change this entry here to the payoff profile that any Nash equilibrium of this game satisfies, namely um, 2u minus u minus u. And um, then we'll use this gadget, so we'll simply add an additional strategy for each player, which is the bottom strategy, and if one player plays the bottom strategy, we get according to this table, if they all play G, well, then they actually have to select an action from this game over here, and then they receive payoff accordingly. Um, now you can see in, that in this case here, if U is actually not zero, so in an astral equilibrium, U is at least zero, if it's strictly bigger than zero, um, well, what happens then this here is no longer a natural equilibrium because player two, or player three would, they would both prefer to deviate. So in this case, there's gonna be only one Nash equilibrium down here. And this, this then gives additional decision problems that are um, hard for the existential theory of the reals um, for three player zero sum games. For instance, deciding if the game, if the given game has more than one Nash equilibrium. So we're always guaranteed to have an Nash equilibrium by, um, by Brouwer fixed point theorem. Um, but deciding if there's more than one, so if there's at least two, that is now hard for the existential theory of the reals. Final thing is that we also have membership of all these problems. So they are genuinely complete problems for the existential theory of the reals. So you can either make a, a non deterministic blum schubs mail algorithm uh, deciding this, so you just guess an equilibrium and see if it satisfies the condition. What is such equilibrium in which class again? Three players? Three players, zero sum games. If there is more than one Nash equilibrium. Uh -huh. 
Um, there's a host of other problems. For instance, we prove, um, we prove that it is existential theory of the reals complete to decide if a three player game has a so called strong Nash equilibrium. So, a strong Nash equilibrium, that is a Nash equilibrium where also no coalition has the incentive to deviate. Um, and an incentive of a coalition means that players outside the coalition will play as before, but all members of the coalition have to gain strictly more than, than what they used to have. So all players taking part in the coalition must improve in order to have a deviation. Um, an open problem I want to state is that this result here we didn't prove for zero-sum games. Um, so what is actually the complexity for three-player zero-sum game of this games for deciding if the game has a strong Nash equilibrium? Yeah, because the, the, the two player has been done many, many years ago, like um, like 20 years ago. Oh, that's still that is, no, that is NP complete. So for two players, you have NP complete. Um, so so if it's not in Gimboa Samuel, it is uh, um, Konitz and Sandholm who did it. Um, Equivalent yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. You can. You, yeah. Um, right. So, so actually, I only have like five more minutes, right? So, so I have a whole other application to, to games I, I would like to, to do. So I don't know, should we arrange another lecture for that? Okay, uh, uh, can you state what you want to state Yeah, I, I'll, I'll do it. I'll just answer your question. Okay. okay. Um, so what is it that is open? So, so we proved that it is hard for the, or complete for the existential theory of the reals to decide if given a three player game in normal form, if it has a strong Nash equilibrium. So a game is not guaranteed to have a strong Nash equilibrium. So this game we construct is not a zero sum game. So I ask what is the complexity of designing if a three player zero sum game has a strong Nash equilibrium. Um, so you can see in the in, in our paper for a whole bunch of other other problems. Okay. Yeah. So 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 let let, let me state what what we prove. <clears throat> So I can convince you to, to listen to it, perhaps. Um, so we consider games um, now. So I'll call these multiplayer simple stochastic games. So it means that we have a graph. It's a directed graph. And um, non leaf nodes are either player nodes um, or 
or random nodes. And a player node belongs to one player, and the player gets to choose the successor of that node. And a random node, we have associated a probability distribution of successors in the graph. Um, leaf nodes contain utilities to all players. Um, so you'd, so a, a payoff vector, one payoff to each player. And then we can consider strategies here. So we start in some node in the graph and proceed along edges according to strategies of players and the random nodes. And we prove that it is, um, and I'll say this is joint work with Stefan Samson. Um, so it is complete for the existential theory of the reals. to decide if, if such a game has a stationary Nash equilibrium with um, payoff constraints. So that is for, you may impose constraints on each player saying that a player should receive at least a certain payoff. This holds even for acyclic games. So in an acyclic game, so in general in these games you're not guaranteed to have an equilibrium, but in an acyclic game you're guaranteed to have an, an equilibrium even in, in pure strategies. However, once you impose payoff constraints, you, you may need to use um, stationary Nash equilibrium to, to meet them, and um, even that is not guaranteed. So it's complete for the existence here of the reals to decide if, if such a Nash equilibrium exists. No. 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 Yeah, there exists an Nash equilibrium. But, but I impose payoff constraints. Yeah, and then you also want to say that back of induction may not satisfy That's right. No, no. Well, you, you cannot make a simple algorithm. This is going to be a, a very difficult computational problem. Should get more than something. Yes. So then, yeah, I understand. Then the cost induction might make Yes, exactly. Right. Um, and it also even holds for deterministic games. Um, so there's a gadget by Wojtag and Ummels we can use to get rid of the probabilistic nodes. One more thing, um, and this is using a result of Boros and, and yourself, Gerbit. Um, so you, you give an example of, of such a game. You have a three-player similar stochastic game where you have even non-negative payoffs in the terminals in which there is no stationary Nash equilibrium. So you can use that as, a, as another gadget add to our construction and show the following is complete for the existence of zero of the reals. So it's complete for the existence of zero of the reals to decide if stationary 
Nash equilibrium exists. And this is obviously not for acyclic games, but for cyclic games. But the only cycle is going to be inside this um, construction. All right, so this is um, what I, given more time, I can, I can talk about. So that's it for today. Thank you very much.